Welcome to the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee campus. It's a delight to have you here. I think this is a very exciting program that we're going to have this afternoon. I hope this isn't your first visit with us. Um, but as I tell everyone, if it is, shame on you. I'm sure it will not be your last visit with us because we constantly have free, engaging, uh, interactive activities that are going on, very informative to the public, and uh, this is another one of those opportunities. Today we're presenting Cybersecurity 101. Um, I guess I should have told you who I am as well before I introduce our panel moderators. Uh, I'm Arthur Guilford, and I'm the Regional Chancellor of the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee Campus. Uh, so um, this is the campus that I supposedly run with, as I told someone today, with a little help from an entire village to help me <laughs> know what I'm supposed to be doing. But today we have, this is another one of our activities in which we've partnered with another very important entity, and we've partnered with Biz 941. And so Susan Burns of Biz 941 will be one of the moderators, and then our own Judy Sedgman, the director of the Institute of Public Policy and Leadership of the University of South Florida, will also be our other moderator. So with that, um, I turn it over to the two of you and our fine panelists to lead us through Cybersecurity 101. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone and good afternoon. Um, as Dr. Guilford said, we're here to learn about computer hacking. What is it, who does it, and how you can prevent it? I searched around a little bit to find out what the economic costs of cybercrime is. And the latest estimate I could find was $1 trillion to companies. And this was in the year 2008. It was really difficult to find an estimate on cybersecurity because a lot of companies don't like to report that their networks have been breached. Um, you probably remember earlier this year that uh, Sony PlayStation's network was breached and hackers stole the personal information, including credit card information, from 77 million customers and ended up costing Sony about $171 million. But the real victim of a lot of cybercrime, and this is according to the interview I did with Dr. Kobanoglu in the magazine, is small business. Why? Because you're most vulnerable. And case in point, I was looking at Security Magazine recently, and they were listing the top 10 security breaches of this year. Number 10 on the list was the ankle and foot center of Tampa Bay. And um, the, the story said that hackers got into, this was not a multinational, this is a small regional business as one of the top 10. And hackers got into their network and stole all the personal information, credit card information, uh, birth dates, addresses, and their health records from 156,000 patients. So, uh, and, and on average, I think what I read was about uh, $329,000 uh, on average is what it costs the business when, the, when their networks are breached. And I'm sure that our panelists will um, update us on some of these numbers. But the point is nobody can afford to lose that kind of money. So it's really my pleasure today to introduce our three experts who, um, they're national experts. They can tell you about who the hackers are, what the latest trends are, and what you're doing that may lead, lead you um, to be vulnerable and how you can help prevent it. Um, to my left, my immediate left, is John Jorgensen. Um, he has been the president and CEO of the Silent Group since 1998. He formally worked for more than 25 years for the National Security Agency in the military as a civilian employee and as a government defense contractor. The Silent Group provides consulting services for cybersecurity, threat avoidance, 
industrial counter espionage, counter cyber warfare, e-discovery, and digital data forensic investigators. I feel like I want to write a spy novel. <laughs> um, his client list um, includes many Fortune 500 manufacturing defense and infrastructure companies. He has um, briefed the director of the NSA, the Undersecretary of Defense, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Minister of Defense for Spain, and it goes on and on. Um, he's also been an expert in um, federal cases regarding this, uh, this subject. Um, next to him is Dr. Jihan Kobanaglu. He is professor and dean of the School of Hotel and Restaurant Management at the University of South Florida School of Hotel, I just said that, at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee. Um, he's a certified hospitality technology professional and the editor of the Journal of Hospi Hospitality and Tourism Technology, technology and a co-author of numerous textbooks. He is also the chair of the American Hotel and Lodging Association's Technology and E-Business Committee and serves on the advisory board for President Obama's National Strategy for Secure Online Transaction Act. In addition, he sits on editorial boards of several tourism and hospitality magazines and serves the industry as a consultant. His research involves the use and impact of technology in the hospitality industry, and he's been featured in many national publications and channels. And then to his left is not Stacy Aruda. Stacy could not be with us today. She had a small accident last night and had a small injury. So replacing her, kind enough to step in, is Steve Stepler. And he's the general counsel, counsel at the Silent Group and also directs electronic discovery and information governor, governance practice at the Edelson Law Firm in Chicago. But he practices here. So let's welcome our panelists, please. Well, to get started, um, since each one of you has worked in different areas of cybercrime and has a whole different set of experiences, uh, we'll just go panelist by panelist. And why don't you each briefly tell us what types of cybercrime you've worked with most and what keeps you up nights when you think about what do we need to know that we don't know? Um, we've coined a word in our uh, presentations and briefing. It's called cybernoia sort of a takeoff <laughs> of paranoia. Um, in, the, in one of the worlds that we deal in, uh, if you are targeted, you are hacked. Uh, there's no prevention. There's no way of avoiding it. Uh, some of our clients, uh, Nucor Steel, Nissan Motors, Bridgestone, Firestone, and uh, many others, uh, all of these companies uh, have technology that is being sought after, uh, but these technologies also are defense contractors. And as defense contractors, uh, they've been, within the last three years, recently targeted and hacked. And as I said, once you've been targeted, you are hacked. And uh, we have had to come up with Silent and the FBI working together, have had to come up with a new means on protecting these companies. And we're just now beginning to publicize that because we haven't wanted to in the past. We wanted to get our handle, uh, handle on the uh, techniques that were being used. <clears throat> so if you want real fear, the real fear is that uh, the technologies being used to do hacking right now are uh, pretty strong and pretty unavoidable. unavoidable. We call the technology uh, persistent, pervasive, and pernicious. That's per pernicious because it's destructive in nature. The intent is to hack into your business or your, if you're a defense contractor, and be able to shut down your company without dropping a bomb. Uh, and they can do it. Um, so uh, on the cybernoia end of it, uh, that's what's happening out in the hacker world, out in the malware world out in the cyber warfare world. Uh, the problem is those techniques are trickling down to common small businesses. Uh, we were called into a situation in Atlanta where a law firm had been hacked and its escrow account of $700,000 had been emptied. And uh, the uh, the law firm called up the FBI. The FBI said to come to silent. Uh, the law firm came to silent. We investigated the incident and discovered that it was the first incident 
of what's called two-factor authentication, which was thought to be impregnable, it was the first incident of two-factor authentication being broken. And uh, we followed that back and discovered why it occurred. And it's kind of interesting because it occurs because people are not being vigilant. It's not because they don't have this great and newest technology, but rather it's because they're not being vigilant. They're not following common sense. And you can't blame people too much because this is, a, this is the new age of hacking. Social engineering, uh, they lay their egg uh, in the business, they wait for a couple of months to go by, they pick the right opportunity, to let the egg hatch. They tell the egg to hatch, and it's, it distributed its malware across the network, and now you've got a problem because now your network is talking to the outside world and telling your secrets to the world on the outside. People would say, okay, uh, this happened to a large law firm in Atlanta. Um, I'm just a small law firm. Well, there was a small law firm in Bradenton that was hacked using the same techniques. And she had $300,000 in her escrow account. And guess what? They got the $300,000. So it doesn't matter whether you're a big or small. It matters whether or not you've been identified as a target. If you're a law firm, you probably have been identified as a possible target. Um, other targets can be automobile agencies. Um, why? Because you keep credit information. Uh, other targets can be um, uh, hotels, perfect example, uh, restaurants, another perfect example, because you're keeping credit card information, PCI information. One of the problems also is that um, the uh, card brands which control the PCI industry, the card industry, the credit card industry, they don't care uh, that you're a small company. Uh, they don't care that you're going to go out of business because of the fines and the uh, responsibilities that are now being levied on you to take all the steps necessary to identify those, people's who, uh, those people whose credit cards have been, have been uh, breached, have been uh, credit card information that's been taken. All they care about is closing the door and stopping the bleeding. Um, so what you find is a t statistic that says that if you have been breached and you're a small company and you've been breached twice, and, and by the way, these organized crime individuals, you know, foreign organized crime, come back again. If they find the door has been opened once, they know that the door is open again or they leave, they leave something behind to allow them to get back into the network. If you've been breached twice, the chances of you going out of business are around 80% within the first three years after the first breach. So these are not only difficult times in the financial world, but they're difficult times because people are after your money. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kovanog, tell, tell us about your expertise and experience. Could you move with the microphone close to you? Sure. Thank you. What, um, what I actually uh, categorize the hackers into three different groups. One, one group that I, I, this is from my research, innocent hackers. These are 14, 15, 16 year old kids in Germany, China, Russia, Turkey, United States, everywhere. They just hack into the computers and systems just because they can. They don't have any particular purpose to steal uh, government secrets or credit card information or personable identifying information. They just do it. This is the least of the problem, but the other two category, one is the commercial hackers where they, their goal is to get into the business's systems and steal the credit card information and replicate that and make money. And I will tell you later some examples of it. The third one is government secrets. Uh, just this morning, Washington Post um, just um, released an article, and uh, this morning the Congress was 
uh, actually received a report titled Foreign Spies Stealing U.S. Economic Secrets in Cyberspace. They have identified that the top two countries where the, the third level of hackers where I put the government secrets, and actually that's the even greater threat to our country more than the, the physical threat like the 9-11 is the cyber uh, terrorism. And the, the top two countries, that, according to this report, which was released this morning, is China and Russia. And I don't know if uh, how that's detailed, but so those are the three uh, big main categories of hackers. I am personally interested in the second category, which is the commercial hackers. The reason is very simple. I am from hospitality industry, where there are thousands of hotels and restaurants. If you look at the commercial hacker, hacking, 90% of them happen in the small business area where how we define small business, the number of credit card transactions for one year is less than one million. If you are less than one million transactions per year, you're a small business as far as payment card industry is concerned, which we will explain in a second. So out of this 90% small businesses, about half of them happen in hotels and restaurants. I always use this analogy. Have you ever went to a vacation for 15 days and you left a big banner outside of your house, we are on vacation, and left all the doors open and windows open, no dog, no alarm, anything. So that's just an open invitation to thieves, right? That's what the hospitality industry is, unfortunately. 55% of the credit card hackings happen in hospitality industry. When you go to a restaurant, when you had, uh, give that credit card to the server, you don't know what's going to happen to that credit card. That's where I come into picture. In my service to American Hotel Lodging Association, what we are trying to do is very simple. Tell the people that, hey, look, when you go on vacation, turn, lock all the doors, put locks leave a light on, maybe even put a, a you know, um, artificial dog barking system. So when somebody <laughs> comes uh, close, it will just bark, bark, give the illusion of somebody's in the home. That's what I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah. Most of the um, security that, that we've seen has to do with building a house with 12 doors and only putting locks on 11. <laughs> and that's typically, uh, John has seen this in many, many instances. Um, one, uh, my, my experience, basically my practice focus is, uh, covers both sides of litigation. So I will represent um, companies and entities that need breach, data breach remediation, help them for disclosure issues, do the investigation, typically together with silent and try to remediate um, any problems before they turn into disasters or catastrophes. Um, that said, that costs money. And um, there are you know, numerous, you can just look online and just look up data breach remediation costs and you'll have some hair raising numbers presented to you even if you're a small business. And then um, once you do that, there's breach remediation, there's prevention, there's detection, notification, course, the remediation, and then there's the attendant litigation that might ensue. Why? Because if you have a data breach for which you must um, make a disclosure under Florida's data breach notification law, and you don't do it within 45 days, you will subject yourself not only to penalties, but to perhaps lawsuits from a variety of sources. This can all cost you money, and if you think that you can buy insurance for it, you might be able to, but remember that insurance companies are there not to just pay you a check when you make a mistake. Um, you're going to have to show that you've done something commercially reasonable in order to, um, in order to cover yourself under, under those policies, typically. So you have to worry about stuff like this, when you have an employee that can come in, or, or this, and it has a camera on it, and you're taking credit card information, or the employee has access to your customer accounts, which might include personally identifiable information plus credit card information, click, 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 and you'll never know. Um, you know, these are things that you always have to be on the watch for. The idea is to understand what you don't know. It's not what you know that you have to take care of, but it's understanding the questions and the issues that you might not know and getting into the sense of, you know, what's my weakest security point? Where am I most vulnerable? 
Um, and what can I do to take reasonable steps? And the idea is not perfection, but defensibility. And once you can get to the point of defensibility, it'll be kind of an ongoing thing where you'll say, you know, gee, I do want to check to see if I left my car, my keys in the car. You know, so you'll be able to do this on an ongoing basis. You run a wireless, um, wireless access point for your clients, do you? For your customers? Well, is it hooked into your server? Um, is it protected and firewalled from your server? Do you know that? Can you say that? Are you sure? Are you sure that your vendor can make it, um, can show you why that is instead of just telling you that it is? These are things that we have to talk about and things we have to address as small businesses. Go ahead. Um, what if you're a small business and you don't have a huge budget? How do you find those vulnerabilities? Most people can't afford IT departments when they're a small business person. If you have, and we run into this all the time, if you have a IT service provider, um, you want to ask him some questions about um, what security he's put in place on your system. All too often, we get called in after the fact and discover that the IT provider has not set the system up to take um, advantage of all of the security operations that can be installed and utilized on that system. As an example, um, are you logging uh, your activity, uh, your event logs, are they turned on? Are your security logs turned on on your server? Are you logging all of your communications activity that's coming in over your, uh, uh, through your firewall? Um, and over your wireless systems? Um, are you willing to pay for maybe a security company to come in and review that once a year? Uh, if you're a larger company, that may be um, larger by, you know, maybe uh, 50 employees or 60 employees. We, we do this now for law firms um, uh, because there's so much at stake. Um, come in and do a cybersecurity audit that may just take a day or may take about six hours. Um, but ask your IT provider, what, what are you doing to secure my system? And um, you, he's going to throw a bunch of words at you and acronyms at you that you're not going to understand. But step back and listen to what he's, listen, listen to how he's telling you this. And if you don't feel comfortable maybe you should get another IT provider to come in and look at your system to give you an estimate for what it would cost to maintain your system. In other words, I'm just bringing in another IT provider to make sure that the current IT provider I have is doing the right things. And most of the IT companies will come in and they'll do a, a little audit on the system and they'll say, oh yeah, we can, for so much money, we can take and supply you IT services on a monthly basis or whatever. Um, another thing to be careful of is that you're paying an IT company $1,000 a month uh, to keep up your system. Um, the IT company is incentivized to do as little work on your system as possible and to increase their profits as much as possible. So you might want to think about rewriting your contract to an hourly contract and having the IT company uh, uh, supply certain information to you about your system on a regular basis. Uh, there are other simple things like um, who has all of the passwords on your system? Who is holding the server password? Has the server password changed? And is it at some... Here's a statistic for you. We did recently a survey on various companies, and we discovered that the password that was being used on the servers for the companies, 30% uh, of the time was the word password with a number one, two, three after it, okay? Um, it seems like Howie Davidson is also a big password now, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of dentists and doctors out there riding Harleys, and their server password is Harley Davidson or Harley or Davidson. Mm. Um, when you're told what the password is, 
you ask your IT company to provide you with the passwords for your server or your exchange server or whatever, and they come back with password one, two, three, you know you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, okay. there's a couple of... Uh, Jihan, you mentioned that uh, primarily people are trying to steal credit card information in order to uh, make money. What do people do with this stolen credit card information, and how, how quickly can, can it be discovered, stopped, and... and uh, um, one, of the, one of the very common ways of um, handling the stolen credit card is to replicate them. And actually, this usually happens as an organized crime. While one particular party, person or persons, are stealing the credit card information, the other party uh, replicating that credit card and then purchasing different equipment, usually uh, mailed to a PO box or to a, even a regular address. But this is then turned over, whatever the product that was purchased, and then turned into, uh, into the uh, sites where they can sell it for much less uh, than what is normally uh, like eBay. And if you ever see a computer, laptop computer, that is normally 1500 but you see that for $750, chances are high that that, that that particular laptop was purchased before with a credit card that was stolen. But I want to just point something to, Susan, to your question, previous question, about the low budget and how to do, uh, yeah. to, how to protect yourself. I'll tell you a statistics that I think you are going to be shocked when you are hearing this if you are not in the restaurant business. Restaurant business is glamorous, right? When you look, the lights and the people coming in. And I'm sure that you looked at that, a restaurant that is packed with pa uh, guests. You said, they must be making a lot of money. I will tell you the profit margin, average profit margin for a restaurant, 7%. That's it. One dollar revenue goes in, seven cents is left after all the expenses are paid. And another statistics from National Restaurant Association, which is going to shock you. If we open 10 restaurants today, three years later, let's come back, only four of them are going to be in business. There is 60% failure rate for restaurants. Now, in an industry, in a small business, and majority of the hotels and restaurants are considered small businesses, how are you going to spend the budget that big companies are spending millions of dollars? What we have done in, in American Hotel Lodging Association is to look at all these small businesses that are being hacked. They are vulnerable. And we came up with this um, kind of best practices. You don't have to, of course, it's a great idea to be able to get the support of an IT team, consultants, and, and all that stuff. But if you cannot afford, which many of the restaurants cannot, they just simply take the risk. They say, whatever. If I am hacked, then I will deal it at that time. And like, like John said, the minute that they are hacked, chances are high that they are going to be out of business. So what happens is that you have a handout. When you go out, you can actually pick one is the uh, payment card industry data security standards. This is a nonprofit organization that has been created by the major credit card uh, uh, companies which actually enforces some of guidelines, security guidelines to companies that accept credit cards. It is not a law yet. It is a contractual agreement that if you accept even one credit card, you must obey. There are 12 regulations. If you were to read, I don't know if you have it in front of you or not. Utah, it is a law. It is in some states. One must, state. One state. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts also was considering uh, to make it a law, but it's going to happen. Right now, it's contractual agreement in majority of the states. If you were to read this statement, it is common sense. When you look at this, it says, hey, install antivirus software. We did a research with restaurants and hoteliers. 83% of the hotels and, and restaurateurs are using antivirus software, which is the simplest thing to do, right? 17% of them don't. It's hard to understand. When you look at the other requirements, it says firewall, install a firewall. The other thing that John just mentioned a little bit ago, change the vendor provided uh, password. When you buy a new computer, when you buy a new system, it comes with a default password. Like he said, password, password, admin, admin, manager, manager. These are very common passwords. When you buy these systems, if you don't change them, 
then that means that when the hacker logs into your computer from the minute that you connected to the internet, they will be able to go in and see whatever that you see. And so when you look at this PCI, Payment Card Industry Data Security Regulations, they look very simple. However, there is behind every simple, every single requirement that you see in this list has a sub-requirement. I will read some of the acronyms there to you. Look at this, SSH, SHFTP, SSL, IPSEC, VPN, NetBIOS. When you read this, do you say, what is this? I don't know anything about this. It really backs you off. What we are trying to do is to write a simple guidelines to the hoteliers and restaurateurs, which will apply pretty much to all small businesses. We say that, look, these things are complicated. However, you can take one step at a time. Like the analogy that I gave you before, when you go into the vacation, lock your doors, you know, make sure that there is a light on, same idea. If you were to do the most common things, which I will tell you here, for example, use strong passwords. Do not post them on a post net and then put it everywhere. The other <laughs> night, I, 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 I and, and this is very common. I, I, just, I need to stop just for a second. You laugh at that. Yeah. We walked in, we had, an H, we had a HIPAA case. We walked into a large facility, 834 computers. The name that they were to log in on was nicely printed in scotch tape to the left-hand side of the monitor, and the password was nicely printed in scotch tape to the right-hand side of the monitor. Oh, dear. <laughs> I challenge you, go ahead and look into your, to your organizations remove the keyboards. How many times are you going to find the passwords under the keyboards? I do, as my part of my consulting business, I go to the restaurants and hotels to do a uh, soft security audit. I'm not certified. However, I just go provide them uh, uh, guidance. And how many times I find all these passwords in all these different places? and install and use an antivirus software. Symantec, one of the antivirus and malware uh, company, released an article a couple of days ago. Every single month, there are more than two million new spyware and malware are being produced. And John said in our conversation that the, the general software out there only detects portion of it. You gotta be using antivirus software. These are simple things. The other thing, I'm not gonna keep it long, but the other one is, for example, apply patches. The software that, that you buy will be released, security patches, gotta, somebody have to make sure that those are patched. And the other one that is very easy to do is make sure that the software that you buy that will handle a credit card information, either store or or transmit a credit card information, make sure that it is payment um, uh, PCI certified, payment card industry. How do you do that? It's very simple. You go to just Google PCI, and then you will get to the PCI's website. They have certified vendors. What that means is that that vendor, the point of sale system that you are going to buy, are in, um, certified that the credit card that you are going to store in that system are encrypted. I will give you one uh, case study. It's a, uh, it's a real story that happened, and I will leave, uh, go to the next uh, panelist here. Dave & Buster's, which is a public, that's why I use the name, it's, it's public. If you just uh, type Dave & Buster's, the restaurant uh, chain, which is in the Northeast area, one day one guy goes into the restaurant. He asks the hostess, hey, do you have peanut in one, he just picks up one of the uh, menu items, do you have peanut in it? I'm allergic to peanut, I wanna just double check before. She says, oh, let me just check with the chef. So she leaves, goes back. This guy takes a thumb drive, USB drive out of his pocket, which has a key logger software. Key logger software is a software that as you type into the keyword, it will keep track of what you uh, type. Very simple. He just takes this uh, key uh, USB drive, plugs into the point of sale system, which was not PCI compliant, which means that the credit card information was not encrypted. And then 30 seconds later, he pulls up, he puts that into his pocket, and the hostess comes back, oh, no peanut, or yes, peanut, he doesn't care. He says, okay, I'll come back later. So then he goes into the parking lot, and then what happens that key logger software that he installed, is anytime somebody comes into the restaurant, swipes the credit card, it goes to that person.
And I demonstrate it to my students, actually. I'm teaching a class. I say, this is so easy. Don't do it, I tell them, <laughs> because then you're going to put me in trouble. But it is so easy to do it. Therefore, the things that a small business can do without spending millions of dollars are very, very easy. In many cases, not really costly. You know, here, here an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, your reputational damage, there was just an article in uh, one of these security online magazines that said, uh, you know, you can immediately expect a 12% reduction in your value of your business if you have a data breach, if it becomes public. So you have to be really very, very cognizant of the fact that there are soft and hard costs to this. Generally, the, the cost of compliance um, is not as much as the cost of remediation that you'll find. And so, you know, while, while it's painful to buy automobile insurance, it's much more painful to pay for a brand new car than to have the insurance company do so. So, it, you, know, the, you know, the prices, everything is becoming much more standardized. PCI compliance is, is kind of a moving target, while one state is kind of, Utah has tried to make it into a law. It is still a standard. That standard will be subject to what a court, if you get sued, says it is, depending upon you know, the, who's sitting on in which area, which region, which type of court. But generally, if you're, if you're making your system defensible, you're taking the appropriate steps, you know, doing patches on your computer, it's very, very simple. Making sure you have antivirus installed and up to date, pretty simple. And these are things that your children are doing right now. Or if they're not doing it, you have to be very careful. By the way, if they're plugging in their computer into or their, their MP3 players or their iPods into your computer at work, you better be very, very careful. It's something about, there, there's a whole idea of hygiene when it comes to computing. And once you take care and you, you keep, a, you, you do computer hygiene, you will effectively take care of most of the problems that you'll have. And, and what Stephen's talking about when he talks about computer hygiene is he's talking about, are you allowing your employees to come into work with their USB stick that has uh, music on it, MP3, and plug it into the computer. Um, a case that we had uh, with a defense contractor uh, involved a uh, IT security person defeating the BlackBerry Bez application install program and installing videos on his BlackBerry. One of the videos that he installed on his BlackBerry had malware on it. That malware, once installed on the BlackBerry, uh, allowed somebody to connect to that BlackBerry and download the contents on the BlackBerry. Once that contents was downloaded from the BlackBerry, it was sold on the internet to the highest bidder. The bidder that bought that happened to be associated with a foreign intelligence agency because the company this guy worked for was a defense contractor. The next thing that happened was, uh, and we tracked this after the event, the next thing that happened was that the BlackBerry was scheduled to record all incidences of scheduled events that involve security. So the individual, the IT security, senior security person, went to an IT security meeting for the defense contractor and his BlackBerry turned on and recorded the event. And then later on in the evening, the BlackBerry would turn on all by itself and it would download that file to another person who didn't realize he was in the chain, and then from that other person, it was downloaded to the intelligence agency. So there's an extreme example of how uh, a video in this particular case, which was uh, a hijack video, if you will, how that video was loaded with malware. And we find this frequently, that people at work are downloading music files, uh, trying to get around the purchase of the music files, so they're downloading from some organization that, and I won't name them so I don't get sued, but downloading their music files from some organization 
so that they can uh, sidestep having to pay for the music or downloading videos so they can sidestep having to pay for it. And those are perfect targets, whether intended or not. They may have been hacked themselves, but now they are carrying on the malware that allows access to your system. And that malware, when that employee comes into work, doesn't understand what they've done, they plug that USB device into your computer, and they download music to your computer so they can listen to music all day long while they're typing away on the computer. That computer has now been hacked and is now owned. Let me, let me ask you a quick question of anybody. How many people use backup tapes here? You don't, don't, I'm, I'll close it, don't worry. If you use backup tapes, um, if they're encrypted, you're fine. But if they get lost and they're not encrypted, you may have a problem. You may have a very big problem, especially if you have client information, personally identifiable information on it, credit card information. Um, you have to look at how you dispose of these things. The best way to dispose of them is a shredder. Um, it's not sticking them in the garbage because it, this information is always harvestable. You know, we have, I just saw two nights ago in my neighborhood, there's a truck that comes around before the waste management people come around and they look for harvestable information. You know, it's like kind of Sanford and Son, you know, brought up to the 2000s, right? <laughs> but, but this is true. And they come and they look for stuff that they think might be saleable. Well, bat tapes that contain information are valuable. You know, old computer hard drives are valuable. You don't get rid of this stuff. You don't shoot it, drill it, burn it, shred it, get rid of it. In a way that you can sleep at night, you're setting yourself up for a problem. This is more about computer hygiene. I'm sure John has more stories about that then. Uh, mm -hmm. You just uh, mentioned the backup tape. Uh, I printed an article just for 1024 of this year. TRICARE, a medical claims processor firm, the, one of the employees uh, had a backup tape and off from his company. He was carrying that in his car in the back seat. He went to a grocery store, didn't lock his car. Somebody came and stole that, that backup tape. 4.9 million medical and financial records have been stolen. And the backup tape was not encrypted. That is one of the most important things that you as a small business owners need to make sure that the credit card information, the personable identifi identifiable information that you have in your systems are encrypted. How can you check that? Some of the small businesses that I deal with, the restaurants, hotels, they don't have a clue where the credit card is stored. They don't know after months pass by that if they are hacked. They don't even know if they are hacked. If you don't know where your data is, there is no way that you can know what's going on to that data. One of the things that I always tell to my uh, friends in the industry that go and check all the systems that you have that you use to process or transmit the credit card information and go start from there. Go to the PCI website, check to see if that particular software or hardware that you're using are on that list. If it is on that list, you, you just went one step. That's perfect. And then there is more things to do to make sure that the data is encrypted. Because without encryption, it's so easy to, to get hacked. And the other thing that you do after uh, you do that, you need to make sure that you are out of scope. There are many, many different things that you can do to do that. One of the new things that small businesses do is use token. There are some companies out there that you can find easily. Instead of storing the credit card information in your server, Instead, you store a token. What happens that when somebody gives the credit card to the merchant, swipe the credit card, that credit card does not go into the, your systems. Instead, it goes to a third party company which has a lot of security. And in exchange, they send you a token, which even a hacker comes and steals that, there is nothing going to be happen because it's just a random number of uh, you know, digits that mean nothing. So that's another one of the ways that, that you can do. But definitely checking, uh, going back and checking is very, very important, even if you are not very, very savvy about technology. About a year ago, we uh, conducted a little experiment. Um, we got in one of our cars, attached a 
antenna to a window and drove from Marina Jacks to the uh, Sarasota, Mem Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Uh, in that drive, we found uh, approximately 60 businesses, um, and we were focusing on law firms and um, uh, CPAs and uh, healthcare individuals. We found 60 businesses that were transmitting uh, over wireless, uh, unencrypted, and uh, uh, password unprotected. Um, interestingly enough, one violation or one incident was serious enough because of the information that we saw flowing that we told the company the, that they were broadcasting in the open. Uh, one week later, we went by and they were still broadcasting in the open. Um, you talk about easy things to do. One of the easy things to do is make sure that your IT provider is capable and competent, and it's not that hard, to set uh, the security system on the uh, wireless system that you're using so that is encrypted with the latest encryption. It's, it's you know, WAP, not WAP, and, or WAP, and not WAP, or whatever. And that the, uh, the level of encryption is sufficient enough that it's not easily breakable. Um, the old wireless encryption systems uh, with the compute power that you have today available to you uh, can be broken by a laptop workstation computer in approximately 15 minutes. Anybody who is using WEP encryption, WEP versus WPA, um, is asking for trouble because of this. The, and I, I think as recently as two weeks ago, I was in a hotel which basically was permitting, was using WEP encryption. And I, this is five years past its, you know, um, time that it should have been decommissioned. And so something, the, these are things that, that even a minor security audit should be able to disclose to you and something you should be able to take care of pretty easily. How, how many people are in the hotel industry here? I just, just of interest. Uh, just, well, for the sake of everybody else and for your sake, um, hotels will have wireless systems that they're operating. You go to the hotel, you hook up to the wireless system, you transmit over the wireless system. Uh, many of those systems are not properly encrypted. And because of that, we've had a number of uh, cases where executives from large companies have come to us and been concerned that information has gotten out that was at a board meeting or at a business meeting for that company. And in one particular case, we found out that the information got out because we could walk into the um, conference hall that they were using and walk up to the podium, and on the podium was a piece of paper with a password for the wireless system so that it could be announced to everybody in the... Okay. And in other case, or other cases, we found out that the encryption system being used was substandard or non-existent uh, for these meetings. These meetings are targeted by the competition, by people who call themselves information collection agencies. And what they are is commercial spies. Um, things happened like the CEO of Cisco was at the podium, was distracted for a few moments, turned back around to use his computer, and it was gone. And nobody knew where it went mm. or who got it. So um, you have to be careful about what you're doing with your information. And by the way, he didn't encrypt the computer. Okay. So at this point, I think uh, as, a, as a consumer, as a person who goes out to dinner and stays in hotels and sets up meetings in public hotels and conference centers, 
what are the questions that I should ask before I hand anybody my credit card or before I tell people to come to a meeting and share information wirelessly? What are the most simple things that I can ask the vendors? I do that. I check into the hotel and I go into the uh, front desk agent and I ask them, are you PCI compliant? And they look at me as if that I came from Mars. What are you talking about? They don't know anything about PCI and they should not know anything about PCI as it states to the title. But what they should know is the best practices that PCI tells you. I will give you an example. I uh, go to, I went to a hotel to do a security audit for the PCI compliance. This hotel was perfect. They were using encryption. They were using all the things that PCI, antivirus software, changing the vendor software, everything. But I went into the sales office where they take the actually contracts for events and dinners, banquets, etc. I saw a board with the banquet event orders are hanged there, which is a very common practice because that's how you know what's going on today so that they can prepare. But all of these banquet event orders were with 16 digit credit cards with the expiration dates and with the CVC on them, card verification code. Why? Because these people fax these banquet event orders with a credit card to guarantee the space. So they didn't black it out, they just posted it over there. I took a picture, that's how I bought my last two computers actually. From the, no, I didn't. I, I didn't buy any of the computers yet, but that's what they do. Another example I will give you. The, so to answer your question, there is nothing you can do. You have to trust in them. That's what we do. When you go to a doctor, you trust the doctor, right? You don't question, of course you can do your checkups. One of the things that uh, we were mentioned here is that the reputation. If the company has been breached, then of course the business will drop, you're not gonna go there. But the other thing that I will tell you, this hotel, back to this hotel, with the sales and everything over there, I took a picture, I showed it to the GM. I said, you are not PCI compliant. Look, you did not train your people enough that when there is a credit card on paper, or if it is fax, first of all, the fax needs to be secure. Now there is electronic fax that can go to a mailbox only one person can access, need by no basis. The other thing that you did not tell them, whenever there is a credit card on paper, yes, there are some good reasons why you should have a credit card, but they need to be locked. They need to be locked in a way that only a few people that you know who have access to that particular credit card information. The other, the other example, this same hotel general manager sent me an email. He says, Jihan, I know you're from Turkey originally. I assume that you speak Turkish. Can you please write me a short welcome um, you know, letter for a Turkish customer who are going to come today? I said, of course, welcome in Turkish. But I scrolled down the email, the thread. I saw the reservation request that was sent via email to him with all the credit card information there. So it was just right there. Again, being PCI compliant, what I'm trying to say that for the small businesses, I don't really care if you spend $1 million on all these systems that we are mentioning here, the encryption, everything. If you don't provide proper training, if, you, they, if your employees do not understand the value of protecting this information, forget about it. You may as well not spend the money because it's not gonna happen, nothing is gonna happen. The, the, uh, we have a case right now in California. It involves a large resort and I'm gonna take a twist to this whole thing. And they found out that one of the employees was collecting this information and they came across it just by chance. They saw that she was reading somebody else's emails. And this person emails that she was reading um, had personal information in it. So they uh, confronted her with it. Um, she said that it just happened that day and that uh, she's sorry, she didn't do it and she was fired because they believed that it had been going on for a while and it would explain some problems that they were having. She turned around and, saw, and filed a lawsuit against them for wrongful termination. Okay, so now this company is in a, law, a wrongful termination lawsuit 
and they called us up and they asked us to do the forensics work because they've got to go to court and of course if you're going to go to court you have to have a forensics company come in and do the forensics work on the data, the electronic data that you've got stored on your computer systems. Okay? Because you can't have your IT department because your IT department can't testify in court as an expert witness. You're going to need an expert witness. So we came in and we said, all right, do you have the, this is Lotus Notes that they were using, do you have the Lotus Notes logs available for us to review to see what her email history has been? Because that would be an easy solution to this whole problem. The Lotus Notes logs that they have only go back one week. They didn't bother to archive it because they didn't expect they didn't anticipate that they would be in a litigation situation, although they had had a litigation situation three months before that. Hmm. Okay, so they didn't, what happened was they didn't learn their lesson. Now we're looking for other information like her computer. And we get her computer, we look at her computer, and we find out that this computer has been restaged during this period of time. And we said to the IT department, where's our old computer? Because our old computer has got the information on it that we're looking for. Oh, uh, we wiped that and we have given it to somebody else. And we said, well, what did you do in wiping it? So we reformatted it. I said, stop, get that computer. Reformatting doesn't wipe it. We can, we can still recover the information off of it. However, if this IT department had gone another step, and they had actually wiped the data off of that old computer, as I told the lawyers, they might as well give up on this lawsuit because they have got nothing on their side for evidence to litigate with. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about um, preparing for that lawsuit that you may have happen to you by doing the right things with your employees. Now, it's, I'm just going to go through a couple of things. One. If you fire an employee, the first thing you do, you take that computer out of service, remove the hard drive from that computer, write up a chain of custody that shows that what you did, when you did it, and put that computer, <laughs> that hard drive aside. Hard drives are cheap, 100 bucks, 100 bucks, 150 bucks insurance. Put a new hard drive in, reload your operating system, reload your software. Okay? Insurance. Second thing, make sure your IT department has all the communication logs turned on, has all the event logs turned on on the server, the security logs turned on on the server, and is, is, is keeping that information archived, is backing that information up someplace so that if you have, <coughs> excuse me, so that you, if you have to go back to that information, you can, you can, you can do that and you can recover it. Now, I'll just give you one quick horror story. A, a municipality had a situation occur where an individual who was a secretary for one of the senior people in the municipality was putting together a PowerPoint presentation. And in putting together a PowerPoint presentation, she had some picture files, some JPEG files, that she was using to include in the PowerPoint presentation. She came in the next day and she couldn't find the picture files that she had just downloaded. So she did a search on the system for the picture files. During the search process, she brought up pornography. And the pornography that she brought up was very disturbing. She had a breakdown right then and there because she had been abused as a child. They tried to find out what was wrong, what happened. She finally could explain it to them. They looked at her machine. Sure enough, here are these disturbing pictures on the machine. Brought in for the investigation, discovered that somebody in the IT department was running a pornographic website off of the municipality servers oh and was downloading JPEGs from foreign sites but the person in the IT department wasn't too cautious about 
the records they were keeping, the logs they were keeping on the servers, naturally. So what ended up happening was this woman sued the municipality for negligence in maintaining their service system. And her salary is being paid to her this day, and all of her medical expenses are being paid by that municipality. It's costing them a fortune. And the reason why is because a judge ruled in the lawsuit that negligence, negligently handling those servers, managing those servers, managing the control of information on those servers, warranted this kind of uh, lawsuit. And she was awarded that lawsuit. So be careful what is on your servers. And don't, don't get into a situation where you have an employee that leaves and can sue you and you can be charged for some sort of negligence because you had not done the right things. You have not, you have not followed best business practices on your computer systems. And now for the bad news. <laughs> um, how many use network, copier, network copy machines? Copy machines that are hooked into your network? Some people do here. These copiers have hard drives in them. These hard drives store every bit of information you've ever, ever copied on them. Personally identifiable information, credit card information, healthcare information, you name it, it's there until it gets erased. If these machines are leased, when they go off leased, it's another area where people are harvesting this, this information. This information escapes your custody and control and gets out into the wild. You will have a passel full load of problems. Newer, copy, newer copier machines, newer network copy machines, have a wiping utility and an encryption and or an encryption utility built into them. If they don't, get another machine. Um, and be careful because some of the vendors are charging an arm and a leg for something which is really a very simple add-on to what you're doing. So take a look at your terms and conditions. Make sure that at the, at the very least, at the end of the lease cycle, that you get some sort of verifiable confirmation from your less sore from the person or the entity that you leased the, in, the uh, machine from that this hard drive has indeed been wiped. So just point free information just to keep in the back of your mind. Um, the new threat of using the cloud to store data. And so I'm wondering um, how we're protected if we're starting to do that. And then a second question is um, a lot of what's happening, at least internally in your company with employees, is not malicious. It's just not setting up good, like those best practices. So I'd like to see if there's any place we could send small business people to find out what the best practices are to give their employees. So cloud, cloud computing right now is an amorphous, very, very foggy term. All right, there are three types, at least as NIST understands it, there are three types of cloud computing. There's platform com cloud computing, there's application cloud computing, and then there's storage computing with maybe processing somewhere in the middle. Um, the, the problem is that right now there are no standards for security in the cloud, none, absolutely none. Whatever you send into the cloud, you're not sure where it goes. Even if you know, you think you know where it goes, your cloud provider may be subsourcing it to somewhere where, they may be, where they may be, there may be less protection for that information you send to them. You need to see your terms and conditions. You need to understand where you're sending it. And, and in addition, the safest thing is to encrypt your information before you send it out into the cloud, period, end of story. There's only one, well, how many people use Dropbox? Dropbox. Dropbox, Dropbox it's an application. Mm -hmm. Do you know Dropbox, you, you have this really wonderful little password you use for Dropbox, right? It says right. it protects your information, isn't that right? Yeah, well guess what? If you get sued, or if someone sends out a subpoena to Dropbox, and maybe not even a subpoena, they will release your information. It doesn't matter whether it's encrypted or not. It'll matter a lot when you try to say, wait a minute, this is my personal information. This is whatever it is. So Dropbox does not, even though their terms and conditions have changed for a few, um, few iterations. For lawyers, this is very important, because if a lawyer sends out his or her information or a firm's information, which we're by nature, by law, and by ethical obligations, we can lose our license if we send out personally identifiable information or client secrets, we can lose our license. Dropbox at first said we protect everything and then did a 180, and then they had a data breach, by the way. So there, there are other applications out there that, you, that will encrypt and that if you lose your encryption password, you're kind of up the river, 
but I think I would much rather lose the key and not worry about someone else having access to my information than not. So you really have to be very, very careful with cloud computing. Read those terms and conditions very, very carefully. Get assurances from your vendor, and at the very least, try to encrypt your information before it gets out into the cloud. If, if you're concerned about your information, don't. Okay? Mm. That's, we know of intelligence operations that are scouring the cloud. And uh, if you think that the encryption routine uh, that some of these companies have come up with to encrypt data is not breakable, you're very wrong. And, and it's all a matter of how much money you got and how much compute power you have. On, on the other hand, if you, but if you take, John, wouldn't you agree that if you take reasonable precautions to encrypt your data before you send it out to the cloud, at the very least, if it's decent encryption, your information will be safer out in the cloud. Yeah, but I wouldn't send scientific patentable information no, out no, to the no, cloud. No, 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 but for business As information. There's yeah. no reason so, to do that. Let me ask a question then. If, if let's say that I, I keep thinking of the number of times that all of us go to a doctor's office and they say, give me your driver's license, your Medicare card, your insurance card, whatever, and they copy everything, both sides. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they walk to some old copier in the back of the office that's been there for quite a while and they run copies of everything, and they give it back to you. Um, if, how would I ever know, if I've done this time and time again over the course of years, how would I ever know where, where to even seek recourse if, I, if my privacy is invaded because I've willingly given all this information to people who may or may not have protected it? The first thing you do is you ask to look at their computer screen, and you see if there's a, if there's a password on one side, and they yeah. Do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, you can, you can basically, um, you can ask your doctor and say, what are you doing? You're, it's going to uh, result in a question, something similar to, I thought you came here for medical treatment, not for an information technology interview. Right. But it is your information, and mm -hmm. you may want to say, look, if, uh, if there was a whole hour on 60 Minutes about um, harvested information off copiers in, in offices, You've just taken all the information you need. Somebody needs to steal my identity and about which I'm going to be chasing uh, ghosts forever mm -hmm. because all they have to do is recreate your identity somewhere else and somebody's going to get that identity. Somebody's going to create a credit card account and you're going to have to be calling up all the three credit card agencies and saying, that's not me. And so you're in, you know, yeah, ask the question. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I will suggest uh, to the consumers is that there is no way to know what's going to happen to the information you provide to the people that you trust. You trust them. I will give you an example. I was checking into a hotel. Do you remember when they were imprinting the credit card, like with yeah. a machine? And now it's not out of PCI compliance. If they swipe your credit card, they can't take an imprint. They can't copy your credit card. I was going into this hotel and in, in Orlando and I gave, and they swiped my credit card, and they took an imprint. And after they took the imprint uh, of my credit card, they just laid it onto the desk where there was another imprinted credit card slip there. So I took my smartphone, I just opened my camera application, I zoomed the information to the imprinted card that was just next to me, I took a picture of it. And then in that hotel, I was given a seminar, and I handed that to the GM next day. I said, what is this? First of all, they're out of PCI compliance. That's number one. Let's assume that their computer is broken. They got to get the credit card information, right? Then it's OK to take the imprint. However, that credit card imprint must be protected in a locked safe that only certain people will have access to. That's one of the things that you gotta, you, and, as a, and I will let you uh, tell what you are going to tell, but as a consumer, what I do to protect myself from this hassle, yes, credit card companies are protecting me. If there is a, you know, somebody uh, charged something that's not me, they, I can dispute and they give me the money. Oh, if my identity is, is stolen, it's just gonna create a lot of problem. What do I do is that I freeze my credit history. 
I call the three credit history companies, Equifax and Trust, uh, Wave or whatever, and then there is a procedure for that. Just check for Florida if you live here. You gotta send them a letter certified, uh, you know, uh, by Notary Public, and then you gotta send them some stuff. But once that's done, yes, it's a it's a trouble for you when you go and shop for a car that they nobody will be able to pick up your credit history without your authorization. You gotta make some phone calls or do this before you shop for a car or credit. But that's a personally what I do to protect myself. Steve. I, two weeks ago, I was in our nation's capital at a conference where we were talking about records management and security and problems with compliance, uh, much like we're talking about here. And um, the, the hotel at which I was staying, since we're giving hotel stories, um, had a shuttle that ran from the hotel to downtown DC. And the shuttle, uh, typically you were supposed to go to the kiosk and provide your credit card. They printed out a, you know, your, your receipt, which had only the last four numbers of your credit card. And everything seemed fine, except for when I had to get out back to Union Station. The, there was nobody at the kiosk. Nobody could explain why nobody was at the kiosk. And so they said, well, we'll take your number on, on the bus, on the shuttle. So what they gave to me, I wish I had a copy of it here, was just like a, a, a xerographic printout saying, print out, you know, write down your name, your credit card number, your date, expiration date, your CVCC number, right? And all this other stuff, and a phone number you can be reached at and give it. And I said, you know, um, and either that or you could pay cash. And I wasn't about to pay cash. So I decided to, um, I had a problem, I had a little, um, but not ADHD, it's when you kind of juggle the numbers around by mistake. I left my proper number for the phone number. I'll give them my number over the phone, but I was going to be damned if I was going to give them my CVCC number on my, on my American Express card. So this is still happening. This is our nation's capital. You know, this is a records management. This is a, a huge hotel chain, probably one of the largest in the world. And yet we're still seeing this sort of um, really bad practices going on. I have, a, I have another question that uh, actually, question. Oh, okay, question over here. Could you want to go to the microphone while you're going? Uh, once somebody steals your identity, how, how quickly do you have to act, you know? As quickly as you find out. You have okay. to take immediate steps because the longer that you take to notify it, the more damage is going to be done that you'll have to explain away. And you're away. responsible, okay. Yeah, figure half an hour, okay. an hour after you find out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, yeah. Dr. Sedgman. I'm Leanne Chung, and I have two questions. One first for the dean, and the second for Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, for the dean, the ho hotel cards that you use, the key to get into the room, how easy is that hackable? And so does it store my credit card information? How long does it stay in there, or is it really, uh, and can I leave it actually in the room, or does it really have any of my personal identification in there? That's a great question. I get that all the time. Okay. It's a myth. There okay. is no credit card information in that key card. There is your name. There and the name will stay in there for 10 years? No, or no, years? no, no. The minute that that, credit, uh, that that key card is reprogrammed, that's erased and the new one comes in. They are reusable. But there is no credit card. There is no personable identifi identifiable information on the electronic key cards that gives you access to the hotel rooms. Does it still say on there that I entered the room at 8.05 p.m. and left at 7.05 not, a.m.? Not, not on the card, but in the lock. The locks have all the trail for security so, purposes. Right. If you were to complain something was stolen from your room, the manager would go to that lock and with a device would download all the entries by housekeeping managers, including yourself, the guest, right. but nothing else. Or if my body was not found in Aruba and they, <laughs> sorry. <Yeah. Okay. laughs> and my question for Mr. Jorgensen, I travel a lot. So end of next week, I'll be in Spain. So if I'm at a um, Starbucks, with my laptop, how easy is it for someone like uh, just sitting behind me to tap? I have a lot of clients who are um, banks here in the States. So that confidential information, how easy is it someone sitting next to me at Starbucks in Spain to actually be able to see my, because it's an AT&T Wi-Fi at Starbucks, you know, even whether I'm here on Bay of Vista or whether I'm in Spain, how easy is that? Don't turn it on. Um, Seriously. And but so that's, you they, can do that you here too, the, at the any Starbucks. The problem is you don't know how secure that Wi-Fi system is. And they've actually had cases where employees have 
intercepted that Wi-Fi or know what the password is on that Wi-Fi and has, have intercepted the information and collected in the Starbucks. So the, the, but that's true of any place that offers you Free open Wi-Fi. Wi -Fi. Right. And okay. the best thing to do is not use that Wi-Fi, but is to buy a Sky Card, which is an attachment that you can put into your USB device, hmm. and that you can that will allow you to communicate through the um, uh, through the cell phone system and connect that way because that is secure, and um, the the information being transmitted over that is encrypted. So don't use, if, if you're an executive and you have a lot of information on your computer, first of all, keep it close to you um, because especially overseas, um, you know, if you think the financial situation in the United States is bad, it's worse overseas. And there's a lot of theft going on right now and uh, it's very easy once you collect information to get onto the internet. There's over 2,000 hacker websites. It's very easy to get onto the internet and sell that information. And depending upon the grade of that information, and they're actually graded, you can, you know, you can make quite a bit of money off of the information. So use a Sky card. Use, a, use an independent card uh, that will plug into the machine and, and allow you to communicate directly through the Thanks. encrypted. I will just add one thing to your question. I agree with him, uh, the SkyCard, but at the same time, it's not possible in overseas locations to buy the SkyCard that easily. What I always tell my students when they ask me a similar question is that if you can use a VPN, VPN is virtual private network. For example, this university provides a virtual private network. Whenever you are, it doesn't matter where you are, even if you are using an unsecured wireless internet access, if you are using VPN, virtual private network, what you are doing that you are creating an encrypted tunnel in a highway. Think of that a tunnel when you go into the highway. When you are not in the tunnel, everybody can see you. Right? When you are in the tunnel, only the people inside the tunnel can see you. So if you use a VPN, um, then you don't have to worry. And the other thing, that if you have to use the Wi-Fi wi and you don't have a VPN, make sure that your email, the websites that you visit, that you transmit the information, has an extra S at the end of HTTP. That S will mean that it is secure socket layer. That means that the information you are going to transmit is encrypted. But again, be cautious about that too. Well, the uh, VPN, how do you know it's a uh, VPN? Well, so like at University of South Florida, if I were to open up my laptop here, I will be at a university over there. Um, if they had free high Wi-Fi for matter. like the students and faculty, that would it, be a it, VPN? It, it's, a for software, the it's a software that, that you download here. You just click on it. Then you'll be able to transmit information through that VPN. Doesn't matter oh. where you are. But uh, your employer should provide that to you. I will put some caution with that. Uh, there is a way of overcoming VPN. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are using <laughs> no. a VPN network <laughs> and it drops connection. Yes, it's slower. Or it's slower. What happens is, what's happening is somebody is intercepting your transmission and is causing the VPN to reset. And during that reset period, it is grabbing, it is grabbing the encryption key for the VPN. Mm -hmm. And it is now going to sit there and wait for you to connect again. And it will use that encryption key to break into your VPN. Now, this is of a particular problem overseas in certain countries because, um, probably shouldn't be saying this here, but there is a lot of university students that are out of work, very smart people, PhDs in math and whatnot, and they share this information and they've come up with ways to break uh, the encryption on the VPN networks. Now, one of the reasons why the encryption <coughs> is breakable is because you're trying to establish a quick connection. This is a layer of security that's on top of the transmission. This is extra added bits to a, that occur to a transmission and therefore slows down the transmission that's occurring. So they're taking advantage of the fact that the transmission uh, has a weak encryption system and they found a way to break into it. And this is. Uh, 
this is uh, part of the two-factor authentication breaking that we that we have one more question, and then uh, following this question, uh, we're going to break. One more. Okay, one more little question. Uh, yes. Robert okay. Price, International yeah. Risk Strategies. Uh, first of all, thank you all for a, a very interesting and useful uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Jurgensen, you mentioned uh, the incident of somebody having their laptop stolen. Right. I know from a previous life uh, with a, as a senior executive with the government and intelligence that um, when you went abroad, it wasn't just a matter of your computer being stolen. It, the second you left the room, somebody was in downloading everything on it. So as a consequence, uh, if I travel internationally, I mean, for my own business now, I actually have a laptop that doesn't have any of the information that I have at Correct. home on my desktop that has financials and so right. forth. Right. Uh, but my question is, um, and, and we also know that it's not just China, but it's also some of our NATO right. partners and others that are very aggressive this way. My question is, how much of a concern is that if you're traveling within the United States at a hotel? Uh, I mean, how worried yeah, do you we, have to be when you're, you know, we, laptop? We're telling all of the executives that we provide services for to encrypt uh, their computers. And um, let's see if I have a device with me. This device holds the encryption key for my computer. If you were to try to get into my hard drive, you can't do that unless I plug this into my hard drive. And it has a finger swipe on it. So, you know, somebody can cut off my finger, <laughs> and it's happened in Hong Kong, as a matter of fact, but, you know, it's. It, it prevents, and I carry this in my pocket, so it's not with a computer. Right. So uh, I hope you don't put it with a computer. So that okay. encrypts the right. computer. Right. There, and it's a good encryption routine. There's also whole disk encryption, which on newer laptops um, can be included, which basically behind the scenes that you can't see will encrypt your laptop so that when it shuts down, anybody who tries to start it up will need that key. Without that key, anything on that computer hard drive is going to look like garbage. Right. Did you have a question? Just a real quick question. Could you use the microphone, please? I, I caught up before when you, you said that web encryption was five years out of date. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if we can now, how much we can trust the manufacturers. Are they still producing routers that have web encryption as an option, or have they stopped doing that? Um, they, they, uh, their web encryption is an option on many of them. It is still an option, yeah because um, it, the older computers that are out there uh, don't have web PSK on them, so uh, they, they still allow the web convert. Yeah. But, yeah. And, yeah. And the problem. And, and, and if you want to know about you know, uh, uh, trusting uh, uh, vendors, uh, look up uh, on Google uh, Cisco, FBI, um, uh, the FBI bought a bunch of Cisco uh, routers uh, that they thought were made in the United States. Actually, they were made in China. And uh, uh, was, the FBI was transmitting out uh, clear information over a port to uh, China for quite a few, quite a few of their uh, <laughs> facilities before they realized that uh, they were using Chinese Cisco routers rather than... Uh, so, you know, everything's questionable, and you've got you to just make sure... Right. Well, thank you very much. This has been, it, if not uplifting, it's certainly been Terrible. informative. Uh, and thank, we thank our panelists very much for this very interesting and helpful program. We hope you found it helpful. And uh, please join us for a little reception afterwards. There's food and refreshments uh, out in the uh, hallway. And uh, I'm sure our panelists will stay around a little while if you, have, if you want to talk with them. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.